Welcome everyone to another ATRA webinar. Today's presentation is sponsored by Seal Aftermarket Products. And here is a short video from Seal Aftermarket. Seal Aftermarket Products engineers and manufacturers Toledo Transkit, the most trusted and complete kits in the industry for 25 years. Toledo Transkit gives you more critical components, more OE components, like premium seals and gaskets, more design enhancements, patented components, and all the little extras you won't find elsewhere. At Seal Aftermarket Products, we don't just make kits, we make kits better. Toledo Transkit is the number one choice of installers because of all the intensive research and development that goes into each component in every kit. Like re-engineered valve body gaskets, preventing EPC damage by eliminating the shredding you get from original equipment. Plus, all of the extra essentials that are included, like spring and screen filters that should be changed at overhaul. Toledo Transkit even includes loose valve body gaskets that fit all 19 bonded separator plates. When servicing Honda and Acura transmissions, shaft nuts are quite often damaged during removal. Toledo Transkit provides all the main shaft, secondary shaft, and counter shaft nuts, so you don't have to try to reuse the originals or pay extra for them at the dealer. Honda Acura kits also include valve body screen filters, pressure tap washers, and other important components like bolt locks, roll pins, and pistons. What you get is a complete kit with great fit and no wasted time or worry about ordering extra parts. If you want the best sealing transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Transkit by name. Okay, if you have any questions or comments, please send your emails to webinars at atra.com. Any questions during the webinar, feel free to text them over to me, and I'll try my best to answer them. This is the last free webinar schedule for the year. It's October 13th and 14th, two weeks from now. It will be on the A760, AB60, and the A960 comparison. Expo is just around the corner. It'll be October 29th all the way through November 1st, which is Halloween weekend in Vegas. It'll be the same place as last year at the Rio. This is the schedule for the rest of the year for the seminars. As you can see, Expo is up next. Then after that, we have the seminar in Baltimore on November 7th. We've been giving away a lot of our own free handouts at these webinar. Uh, seminars across the country, and we give away one free package to Expo. So for you guys that have won these, I hope to see you guys at Expo. Today's presentation, we're going to be talking about the 6R60 ZF6HP comparison. The reason we brought this about was a lot of times the tech will ask us uh, questions their first time building a ZF6HP. When asked if they've ever built a 6R60 before in a Ford, and they said yes plenty of times, well, if you built a 6R60, you can be, build a CF6HP. They're basically the same unit. As you can see, there's quite a few vehicles that these transmissions fit in, whether it's the ZF, or as you see here with the Ford, it's the 6R series. Except for the Falcon, which was still built in the European market, that would be a ZF6 just like the territory over the European market. What we did find, though, looking through the uh, vehicle application charts, and this was information we obtained by Ford, back in 05 to 07, they actually had a Ford version of the ZF 6HP26 used in the Navigator. Uh, later on, they used the 6R80. Also, the Town Car did the same thing. Mercury Mountaineer always used the 6R series. This is what the Navigator ZF6HP looked like from 05 to 08. And you can see the Explorer just below it. This is the 6R series from 06 and later. This is a typical ZF6HP found in a Jag or BMW. 
And this one's a little bit different. We're showing you this example of a Volkswagen with a ZF6HP 19 all-wheel drive. And this is the information I was talking about earlier. This is the Ford remanufactured powertrain information. Now, this can be found on Google. Just go ahead and go to Google and type that number that you see there in, and you can get 200 pages of uh, information on reman assemblies as well as all the part numbers that go to it, all the OE numbers. Now let's take a look at the Navigator with the ZF6HP. This is the 05 to 08. The identification tag is located right here on the right-hand side of the bell housing. And on the left side of the case, you can see that this transmission was actually built in Germany. It's referred to as a 6HP, not a 6R60 series. But what's unique about this transmission, it has the ZF and the Ford emblem embossed on the side of the case as well. And this is the 6R60 series, 2006 and later. The ID tag is right about the middle of the case on the right-hand side. And the typical ZF series uh, ID tag will look similar to this. And it can be found in different locations on the case. On this particular model, this Volkswagen all-wheel drive is found here at the bottom of the bell housing. Now, the top cooler line on both the domestic or the European models is the return line for the cooling system. As you can see here, this is the Ford ZF6HP, the 6R80 on the right, and the same thing here with the Volkswagen all-wheel drive. The top cool line is the return line. What we found unique on this particular case is there's an engine speed sensor located on the bell housing. Uh, what you will notice also, there's this different type of holding fixtures to uh, rebuild the transmission with the taken on the bench. Uh, there's a couple of different setups, as you can see here, for holding fixtures for rebuilding. The line pressure tap is located here just above the cool lines, and it's the same on the uh, import as well as the domestic vehicles. When it comes to transmission service, drain and fill is different from model to models, as well as fluid type and fluid specifications that will vary according to make and model. As you can see here, this is the uh, Navigator ZF6HP uh, from 05 to 07. It's got a plastic pan on it, and this is the actual uh, drain plug. It's also made of plastic. It has a 10 millimeter Allen head. Uh, be careful not to use an air tool here. This is something that should be done with a hand tool. Obviously here on the right you see it removed. The filter is a part of the pan itself. And on the bottom photo we're showing you the fill level plug and the pan takes a rubber gasket. Now it's recommended to use ZF Lifeguard Fluid 6 or OV approved transmission fluid. And this would be the Explorer with a 6R60 series, 06 and later. As you can see, it's a little different here. We do have a dipstick. And right on the dipstick, it verifies that you have to use SP-type oil. The filter is separate. The pan has no drain plug. It's just a metal pan. Now, we're going to talk a little bit later on in the webinar about the change in fluid. 2009 and later, the 6R80 requires LV fluid. Some techs have told me they've used the metal pan and separate filter from the 6R60 on the uh, Ford ZF6HP. This is a fluid chart right from Ford, so it's kind of important to use the correct fluid for the make and model you're working on. Looking at the ZF6HP, and you can see the 6R60 and the 6R80. The 6R80 in 2009 went to an LV fluid. There were several other changes uh, along with the fluid change, and it's a good reason why they, the uh, fluid should be used on the uh, 09 and up. Uh, you should use the LV on the 6R80s, and we'll cover that later on in the webinar also. 
Now, one of the shops locally here is a 20 Bay shop. They actually rent part of the building out to a converter company, so it's a great place for me to do a lot of my research. Uh, one day at that shop, they were working on a 6R80, and it was like a 2011, which was past 09. Uh, they used the same type of fluid, uh, synthetic fluid, across the board for everything. And when they used it in place of SP, there wasn't a problem. This particular vehicle required LV, but they used the uh, multiple-use uh, synthetic fluid, and they developed a TCC shutter and slip. Now, they had the vehicle, uh, the transmission out of the vehicle a couple of times, even cut the converter open, and the only fix for this was to actually use the LV fluid. This is the drain and fill on the Volkswagen. As you can see, the fill plug is at the bottom of the case towards the back just above the pan rail. This also has a metal pan with a separate filter. As you can see here with the transfer gears in the back, uh, this takes gear oil. Some units may actually have a fill plug located on this side of the case. Again, this requires ZF uh, Lifeguard Fluid 6. Um, what's kind of unusual with this pan is you'll see the large plug with the 17 millimeter Allen. That's actually the level of the fill level plug. The drain plug is the smaller 5 millimeter Allen plug towards the front. And as you can see by the pan layout, this is basically what the uh, fluid level plug would be located here. And on the other side of the case for this Volkswagen, you can see that the gear oil fill level plug is located here, as well as the, the uh, gear oil fill level plug for the differential. This factory recommended oil is SAF AG4 1016 oil. Now, when it comes to valve body removal on the 6R uh, series, uh, it's a little bit different than what you'll find on the ZFs. Uh, there's eight bolts that have to be removed from the valve body. They have larger torques heads than the other bolts. And you'll see that um, up close when you take the valve body bolts out. Now, you also have to remove the three bolts holding the solenoid bracket in place. Now, once the valve body is removed, you'll find a thermal cooler bypass. This is not found in the ZF models. You can see it here as it goes in, it's the spring first, then the valve. Then you'll find the bridge seal under the valve body. It's usually a yellow plastic. It'll have four seals, two on each side. And then there's four uh, feed tubes also found in the case. And two of them are black. They're the same length, the, short, they're the shorter of the, uh, of the four. And then they have a green one that identifies it's a little bit taller, and then the blue one is the tallest one. And we're showing you here how they're laid out and which way they go in. Now, on the ZF6HP26 and also on the 19A, uh, the only difference here is there's only seven bolts to be removed from the valve body on either one. The Torx bolts are all the same size heads. And on the ZF6, you still have three bolts holding the solenoid bracket, whereas on the 19A, the all-wheel drive, there's actually four bolts uh, holding that bracket in place. Now, obviously, before the valve body can be removed, you have to pull up on this lock and then remove this sleeve. And that's the same thing on the 6R series as well as the ZF6HP. Now, there's some upgraded seals for this sleeve, but they are known to leak. Uh, they had a problem with the seals swelling, uh, and then they would leak, so they have some updated seals for that. As you can see, the 6R series has the thermal cooler bypass, not found on the ZF. What's a little bit different on the 6HP19 all-wheel drive found on the Volkswagen is there's a metal clip holding the actual internal harness here. Uh, this sleeve, once you remove the clip, the sleeve would be pushed inward as you lift out the valve body, you would take the, the harness out with it. Again, there's no thermal valve located on any of the ZFs. Now on the 6HP26, you'll find a, um, a black bridge sail 
It has the same four seals that we found earlier on the 6R series, uh, about the same height. What we did find different on the uh, ZF-19 uh, all-wheel drive is it has this oil baffle in the back. And we noticed also that the bridge seal is a lot taller than anything we had dealt with before. Now, one of the biggest problems with this transmission with delayed engagements, sending codes, is these bridge seals like to crack. And obviously, if it's cracked, it's going to need to be replaced. And again, on the Volkswagen, the ZF6HP19 all-wheel drive, three of the feed tubes are the same size. They're all uh, black in color, and then there was one larger one. And they would go in this order as you put them in the case. Now, these tubes are all uh, held in place with some tension springs. And then the springs are held in with four retainers. All of the units air check the same. So you have this air check chart with the valve body off. You can check all your clutch packs. I suggest using 30 PSI of pressure, not full shot pressure. Uh, much easier to catch a leak if you're using 30 PSI of, of shop air. Because you have to regulate the blow gun down. Now here's some comparisons that we're going to go through here between the ZF6 and the 6R60 series. And starting from the left to the right, this is the 6R60 E clutch drum. And this one on the left is the uh, only takes two sealing rings. And it also has a bushing journal located here just below the splines. And there are 27 splines on the shaft. Again, two sealing rings with the bushing journal. This is TCC feed. So they're obviously using this sealing ring and this bushing journal here as a seal. So it's going to be important that these bushings are not worn out because this is going to cause converter issues. The other thing that we noticed on the uh, ring gear on either one, the 6R60 or the 80 series, that the inner teeth were hardened, but the outer uh, outside part of the ring gear was actually a softer metal. Now, the 6R80 is going to have 32 splines. Notice there's no bu bushing journal here. Now, they've added a sealing ring, so we have three sealing rings. So, obviously, they're sealing the converter feed oil circuit with two sealing rings. Shaft's a little bit larger. Same thing with the ring gear, though. The inner gear teeth are hardened, where the outer outside area is not. Now, on the 6HP19, that we, we were using that example from the Volkswagen. And this is the 6HP from the Navigator. Uh, both of these had 27 splines, no bushing journal. Each one took three sealing rings. And obviously the 6HP26 did have a larger shaft. But the entire ring gear is hardened. You can tell the difference in the color. So the inner teeth and the outer part of the ring gear are both hardened steel. Now a comparison on the state of support. So in the 6R80 series, they don't take a bushing, as you can see here on the left, and the 6R60 does. Again, this is important that we have these uh, clearance on these bushings down to about one and a half, uh, one to one and a half thousandths. One of the things we notice on the state of supports when we flip them over, you can see that there's a difference in the feed hole here. This is more in the flat area where the feed hole that you see here is um, actually part, part way up the shaft. On the Ford series, all the 6R series, we found a check ball located here, where the other two did not. Um, all the 6R60 uh, and 80 series had a 27 spline stator support. Now, as far as the ZF6 code, they could have 38 or 43 spline stators, depending on engine size and model. Now, there's also a 6HP19, as you can see in this note in your handout, um, that the state of support that uses the same front bushing as a 6R60. We just did not have one available to take a photo of it. Now, a closer look at these ring gears that we mentioned, uh, the, the, the hardness of the metal on the outside of the 6R series. Uh, we, we discovered this when we were taking an electronic scribe that we wanted to mark the parts to identify them later. Uh, when we used the, the electronic scribe on the 6R series, it easily 
etch uh, the ID marks that we put on that one, it was very difficult to etch any kind of ID marks on the ZF6. The other thing that we noticed is on the ZF models, this bearing is actually staked in place. It can be removed, uh, but it's held in place pretty well by, by the stake marks that go around it. As far as the 6-star-60 series goes, the bearing just lifts right out of the drum. Now, this is the most crucial point when it comes to clearances with bushings, and that's the one at the back of the stator. Now, we don't want no more than one and one-half thousandths of an inch of clearance. Now, all the e-drums we found, the large input shaft measured about 1.180 thousandths, and the smaller shafts were 1.21 thousandths. Now, some replacement bushes may not be tight enough in this area. So this is something that should be checked on every rebuild. So if you use a bushing that's already a little bit loose within time, it's going to, a short time, it's going to become uh, more and more loose, and we're going to have a leak in that circuit. Now, here's the best way to check the bushing. We measured the shaft. Right? This is the larger shaft. Obviously, it's a 1.180 thousandths. We put a new bushing in the stator support. We measured that, and it came out to one and a half thousandths clearance, which is just right for what we needed for this vehicle. This is the smaller shaft we're showing you here. And you'll notice that once we measured the bushing, we can see we had four thousandths clearance. That's too much. We're definitely going to have a leak in that E-clutch oil circuit, so we need to find a bushing that has a tighter fit. Another crucial bushing is the one on the back of the E-clutch drum. Now, this is especially on the drums without the bushing journal on the front end of the input shaft. So remember, if we have a bushing on the front and back of the stator support, that's going to keep the center line of the drum held with more support. Now, obviously, the stator supports and the, and the input shafts without the front bushing journal, uh, it's going to put a little extra load on this bushing. So this is another bushing we want to try to keep the uh, clearance down to one and one half, uh, one and a half thousandths. Whether you're working on the 6R60 series or the ZF, uh, this we're showing you a two-wheel drive here. They're basically the same, although the parts are not interchangeable. Uh, we tried swapping some drums around, uh, trying to make some clearances up for them. Uh, it was too difficult, but just much easier to keep the correct parts with the correct transmission. I will talk a little bit about these drivetrain differences. At times, or quite often actually on the tech line, we've had guys install this uh, backwards. This is the correct way that it's uh, located in the back of the case. Now, this part of the gear comes off this, the uh, pinion shaft that goes down to, to the differential. There's a Torx head bolt inside of here. And uh, to just take a, we'll show you how that part comes apart, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, to remove the shaft from the case, there's a retainer bolt with a tip on it located right here on the side of the case, uh, real close to the differential. And that tip actually goes in this area here. There's nothing to really align it up. It's just basically there to, uh, as a retainer, you have to remove it to get the shaft out of the case. Now, again, like I said before, this is the correct layout for the gears. This is wrong. What will happen is you'll get an extreme gear train noise uh, as soon as you start to drive the vehicle. Do not attempt to drive it very far at all. If you start to hear the noise, you should stop and bring it right back to the shop. You probably at that point have already done some damage to the gears. You see here we're removing that Torx head bolt to remove that gear. Once the gear is off, the uh, hole that's threaded for the bolt, we actually used a puller tool for a couple of sockets and we're able to pull the shaft out this way. Now before you can obviously pull that out, we have to remove this snap ring. Now, in front of this snap ring, there's two metal clad seals. This separates the transmission fluid from the gear oil. Uh, they're pretty difficult to get out, but they, it can be done. You remove those two seals. We modified a, a long handle uh, 
needle nose pliers. We modified them to fit the snap ring. Took the snap ring out and with our core set up, uh, we were able to remove the shaft from the case. <clears throat> a couple more differences we want to show you here is the A clutch hub and the E clutch hub. Now on the Ford shown on the left, uh, we identified these by the square holes and the E-Clutch hub had small round holes in it. On the Ford ZF6HP, it had the same square holes, but it had identification grooves etched into the, uh, that, this part of the hub. The E-Clutch hub had uh, rectangular holes in it. Going over to the Volkswagen that we were using as an example, it had the same square type holes, and it had uh, rectangular holes in the E-clutch hub also, but it all had uh, smaller holes with it, uh, square holes here with it. So you can see there's a difference between the three of them. Also at the other end of the shaft for the E-clutch hub, we found on both Ford uh, ZF6 and the 6R series as an orifice cup plug here, whereas with the Volkswagen, the shaft was hollow all the way through. The other thing on the Ford uh, 6R series, uh, this is a cast steel hub. It's a very heavy duty, uh, very well made hub. The uh, other two were actually made of like a corrugated sheet metal. Also on the 6R series, the E-clutch hub consists of two pieces held together with a retainer ring. Again, this hub is very heavy duty. All the ZF models that we uh, we're working with all of one piece. Now another look at the uh, 6R series versus the ZF6. Uh, again, we show you the ID groups here. Just one way to identify it. Uh, the other thing is that this race for the thrust bearings actually has three tabs and it retains it right here on the drum. The Ford does not. So if the bearing comes right up, there's no, uh, no tab to hold any races or anything in place. I flipped this over to show you how the, uh, where the tabs look like. What you want to remember here is if we replace this drum, we have to remember to pull this race off and use it on the replacement drum. Now on the planetaries, we found a few differences here also. Um, this is the 6R and the ZF6 four pinion uh, planet assembly. They're the same as far as their layout. They're uh, all held in with a wavy type retainer ring. Now you've seen in the past we've talked about coming in through the side with the scribe. Uh, we tried something a little bit different. We actually removed this thrust washer. Um, it's clipped on there but it comes right up. Uh, once we did that we found it much easier to just look in through the side and use these four holes to actually uh, remove the uh, retainer ring. Once we did that, the planet came right off, and there's the ring that we were talking about. Okay, this is the ZF uh, typical three-pinion planet. It also has a retainer ring. Uh, again, we showed how we come in through the side. This is one of the ways we did it before. This retainer ring actually clips onto these four tabs. And there's a little bit closer picture of them. You can see where the snapping would go right into those grooves. Again, using the scribe coming through here, just removing the uh, retainer ring to lift that off, with or without removing the washer. Now, there's a different one that we ran into lately, and this is the three pinion that's held in with tabs. Now, at first off, these are the tabs that actually hold the planet in place, and you can see the planet is splined into these other uh, tabs here. Now this tab, uh, first time we did this, we actually bent the tabs up, but these tabs are supposed to have tension on them, so you really shouldn't do it this way. The correct way to do this would be to go in where the tabs are located, leave the tabs that are bent over the planet, hold them in place alone. What you'll find all along here are these locking tabs. Now, obviously, if we're putting this back together and had to bend these tabs back down, they're really not going to have the same tension on them. You'd have to bend them past the planet a little bit to have tension on them. So what we did was we lifted up on these locking tabs. Now, once we did that, we're showing you a little closer picture. You can see these locking tabs actually hit this raised area on this whole shell, 
you have the shell here. This is the raised area on the drum. So once we bent these up, we took a screwdriver and we just tapped it to the left. Now you can get the tabs right off the planet. So now the planet can lift right out. And what it looks like when you remove it is this whole shell comes out in one piece as well as the planet. What we found was this area here is actually this rounded edge is slotted underneath. And this part of the shell will actually go underneath there. And you just knock it back in place until you get these tabs right about even with these. And then you just knock the tabs back down. We didn't upset any of the tension on the other tabs that actually hold the planet uh, to the drum. Another thing that we found here that uh, we, we tried it both ways, um, removing this snap ring. You can see the snap ring ends have to come up to this uh, tab on the pressure plate. There's a cutout here also for another tab located here. Let me give you a little bit closer look at the, the tabs on the plate as well as the cutouts on the snap ring. Now, you can remove it by starting here and going around with the, a small screwdriver or a scribe, but it's much easier to use the factory method, which is about 180 degrees across from the tabs. You start removing the snap ring from this side, and it comes out much easier. There's no struggle at all. But this one is a little bit difficult. A little information about the valve bodies. It's just some basic information. There's no way I could cover every ZF valve body there is out there. But we wanted to give you some idea of how the difference is and the easiest way to identify them. We found with the ZF Series M shift, this is the manual shift setup. Uh, this will actually have a cable and a shifter that will pull the park rod out of park. We found nine check balls. Uh, we have legend numbers for some of this. You'll find the legend uh, material in your handout. This is the area that we used to identify the valve bodies quickly when we went from one valve body to the other. Notice the angle of the bathtub is almost, it's not quite straight, but it's angled pretty much, uh, not that much above being flat right here. Now, once we went to the uh, Generation 1 E-Shift, you can see this area is completely different. That was the first way we were just using to identify. And you can see we have the accumulators here for the solenoids, and then we have our check ball locations there. Now on the 6R series, you'll notice the bathtub is angled upward a lot more than you saw earlier on the ZF6M shift series. And this only had eight check balls. And this is the ZF Series M shift. It's the exploded view of the valve body. You can see this has a manual valve in it. This is the other side of the valve body we're identifying from. And this is the Gen 1 E shift. This is pretty much easy to, to, to determine this one. It has an extra solenoid here. This is the hydraulic solenoid that helps this park lock cylinder pull the park rod from the park here. This uh, solenoid is mechanical. It basically latches onto the uh, park lock cylinder uh, when it's not in park. This is a typical 6R series. You see the difference here in this location of the valve body. Again, the 6R series all have manual valves. And this is the M shift. You can see by the bathtub is almost uh, straight. It's not angled that much upward. And these are the rest of the valves located in this valve body. Gen 1 E-shift. You can see there's an extra valve here. And again, this is the area to look at real quickly to see the, the difference between the E-shift and the M-shift. And we're back to the Ford. These are some of the small parts that go into the valve body. Uh, what I want to talk about here is there are six solenoid accumulators. These accumulators actually uh, buff out the signal from the uh, pulse modulated solenoids that control pressure to the clutches. Now, there's six of them, except for the 6R80 models from 2008 and a half to 2010, there was only two. So you may find on those models, there's going to be only two accumulators here. Now, the 6R60 and 75, 2008 and a half, so we're referred to as J2. Uh, models. They have the spring removed. As you see, there's some models will have this spring. 
they had Bosch solenoids. They added a, a bleed to the D clutch. These used Mercon SP. And they'll only have the two accumulators. Now here's the legend that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, we have the legend numbers like we were using 26 for the check balls. And as you can see on the ZF, we have nine check balls. We identify all the spring dimensions of the ones that we found, as well as the valve description. And this is the 6R series. I want to thank Fabian over at Sunbelt Valve Bodies in Tampa, Florida, for providing us with this information. <clears throat> Now, here's some of the major changes that happened right around that 2008 and a half. Now, what happened was Ford went from a Bosch solenoid over to a Saturn solenoid. Now, there's a 6R60, the 75 and 80 referred to as TCM-driven units. That means the TCM is right on the valve body. Now, they were initially released with Bosch solenoids and six dampeners. Now, that was for the 60 and the 75 until about 2008 and a half or the J1 units. So, again, these were the two they retained for the pressure control solenoids on the 6R80 series that went down to two of them. If you have the six accumulators, you'll have the six holes located here in the plate. You also have all the part numbers listed for each one of these. Now, in 2008 and a half during testing, Ford felt that only two were required, so they eliminated four. And as you can see, this is the part number for the plate that only has the two feed holes for the two accumulators. And at the same time, the D1 regulator spring, that bore we were talking about, 201, was removed. They added the bleed circuit to the D clutch. These all required Mercon SP. Somewhere in 2009, they eliminated the cast feed to the accumulator bore 109 and switched to LV fluid on the 6R80 series. Now, although the function for this design in 2008 and a half model year was not really verified or tested, this is something that they just went and did. This was actually emails uh, correspondence back and forth from Ford engineers uh, to our office. Now, in 2011, the Saturn solenoids and the solenoid strategy entered the picture right about 2011 called uh, non-TCM controlled uh, units. And that basically what they did was they took the TCM off the valve body and placed it up inside the vehicle. These models will have a one-way clutch or sprag, a low reverse sprag. Now, these solenoids required putting the dampeners back in, so they had to bring them back. And as you'll notice here, you have uh, all six holes drilled in the plate. Now, there's one half year on these six-point liter uh, engine vehicles from 2010 and a half to 11 that had Saturn solenoids, no TCM, but it did not have a sprag added, so it still had no sprag in it. So you can see where this can become confusing. Now, at this point, they also changed the separator plate, and they went to a bonded gasket plate, very similar to what you see on the GM models, like on the 4060Es, the 4T65s, and so forth. Now, the reason that they went to this bonded plate was it was just much lower in cost than doing the silk screen design plates. You have a list of all the part numbers for all the different plates and the model years that they go to them. And that about does it for today's presentation, sponsored by Seal Aftermarket Products. If you have any questions, please go ahead and text them over to me now. If not, I want to thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time.